So good morning, everyone. Um, I think it's 7.30. We'll get started with uh, Urology Grand Rounds today. Uh, this morning, we have Dr. Jody Sherman, who's going to be talking about healthcare pollution and disease burden, first do no harm. Uh, Dr. Sherman is an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology of the Yale School of Medicine and an Associate Professor of Epidemiology in Environmental Health Sciences and a faculty in the Yale Center for Climate Change and Health in the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Sherman is an internationally recognized researcher in the emerging field of sustainability and clinical care. Her research interest is in life cycle assessment of environmental emissions, human health impacts, and economic impacts of drugs, devices, clinical care pathways, and health systems. Her work seeks to establish sustainability metrics paired with health outcomes and costs to help guide clinical decision-making and professional behaviors toward more ecologically sustainable practices to improve the quality, safety, and value of clinical care and to protect public health. Dr. Sherman routinely collaborates with environmental engineers, epidemiologists, toxicologists, health economists, health administrators, health professionals, and sustainability professionals. Dr. Sherman is the founding director of the Yale Program on Healthcare and Environmental Sustainability and the medical director of the Yale New Haven Health System Center for Sustainable Healthcare. So Dr. Sherman, uh, can we share your slides now? Thank you for this opportunity to present to your department today, Dr. Kellner, and also to Dr. Kenny for hosting me, and uh, to Dr. Leitman for the invitation. Today I'll be talking about, uh, excuse me, um, for a little uh, uh, glitch here in the title here, it's, it's healthcare and the environment, balancing patient safety and public health. Uh, this will be much broader than anesthesia. Uh, learning objectives for today are to identify the relationship between healthcare pollution and disease burden to define life cycle analysis, which is a tool we use to quantify environmental emissions, to summarize the latest healthcare uh, pollution findings and to identify opportunities for public health advocacy um, and for mitigation. So why sustainability in healthcare? Uh, pollution is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality globally. Um, so responsible for 9 million deaths annually or 16% of premature deaths. Healthcare itself is a leading emitter of environmental pollutants and reducing healthcare pollution can improve the triple bottom line, which is the best care for the most patients at the least cost. And importantly, engaging health professionals around healthcare pollution is uh, a key to um, public policy and society transformation. So why sustainability? We live in a finite world and human health is dependent on environmental health. Uh, as I just mentioned, Pollution is a leading cause of death and healthcare is the leading emitter of pollution. So this talk is gonna be mostly about climate change, but there are more environmental um, issues than just climate change and they are related. These are um, uh, from uh, sort of the, the planetary boundaries or the interactions of uh, dimensions of ecological health. Um, that are related. So for example, climate change is closely related to this ocean acidification, which is our largest uh, carbon sink, which is becoming overwhelmed. Um, biodiversity loss, for example, we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction, which is dire directly related to uh, land overuse. And for example, the, these are closely interlinked in terms of the emergence of zoonotic diseases, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2. And so the red means we're living outside of the plant's boundaries, the ability for it to regenerate itself. Gray means we don't know exactly where we are yet. So for example, chemical pollution, there's about 100,000 industrial chemicals out there. Um, we don't know um, all the ways that that's affecting our planet, but we do know that pollution is ubiquitous. And uh, the green represents the area of, of living within the planetary boundaries and the, going into the centers, so there's a shortfall. So for example, in the care, case of healthcare pollution, obviously we can reduce our pollution by reducing healthcare. Um, the amount of care that we deliver, that's not what we're suggesting. Uh, obviously, we have to increase access to care, but we have to do it in a sustainable way. So the sweet spot is called this donut. And that is the, the intersection of the ecological ceiling and the social foundation. And so climate change shifting, this talk will be mostly about climate change has been deemed a medical emergency. Um, you've heard about uh, uh, President Biden's commitment to reduce our uh, national emissions by 50% by 2030. There are great reasons for that, which we'll discuss. 
Um, but if we look at uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, if we go using polar ice caps and carbon dating, um, the slide from NASA is now old. We can actually go back 850,000 years and see that the CO2 in the atmosphere has fluctuated between 180 and 280 parts per million. And then there's this famous on the end hockey stick curve, what's happened since the industrial revolution and uh, burning of fossil fuels. We're actually now over 412 parts per million, which is the highest that the planet has known to the best of our knowledge. And this hockey stick curve is directly correlated with rising temperature. We are now one degree centigrade on average surface temperature, that's not um, the same across uh, the globe. So it could be 40 degrees different centigrade on the polar ice caps, um, but on average one degree. And we're expected to reach one and a half degrees by 20, between 2030 and 2050. And so this is rapidly rising and we're reaching a tipping point. This has resulted in leading scientific organizations across the globe calling climate change a medical emergency. So what does climate change have to do with healthcare? Uh, well, as we uh, see um, rising levels of CO2 and rising temperatures, we have more extreme weather and rising sea level. We're seeing more um, heat, extreme heat days and heat related illnesses, cardiovascular and COPD exacerbations, uh, severe weather events resulting in trauma and migration, uh, this is closely linked with air pollution because burning of fossil fuels releases not only greenhouse gas emissions, but toxic air emissions such as PM 2.5. So, um, and these, and ozone, uh, uh, low layer ozone, ozone, and as heat, um, as where the planet is warming, these pollutants are trapped closer to um, where we live and breathe. Changing and emerging vector ecology as the habitats are expanding that are more habitable, uh, hab, um, habitable to um, their thriving. Increased allergen seasons, again, more exacerbations. Impacting water quality when we have sea, um, sea level rise and storms flooding our fresh water systems, flooding our sewage systems and also contaminate our, our fresh water and uh, droughts and wildfires as well. So these are all ways that, uh, and then civil unrest with mass migration, which is really um, one of the key problems with the Syrian crisis. So all these are related to rising CO2 uh, levels and rising temperature. So this is increasing the demands on our healthcare systems. And this has led the um, going back now to the prior World Health Organization Director General Margaret Chan to say climate change will be the defining issue for health systems in the 21st century. Health professionals have the knowledge, cultural authority, and responsibility to protect health from climate change. We don't have the knowledge yet. That's why we're here. We need to rapidly work on that. So some of the things we're seeing from healthcare-related weather events and healthcare services from Hurricane Sandy, as uh, we will recall, um, uh, these are images from New Jersey and also New York City, very famous uh, Langone Medical Center being evacuated and completely incapacitated. This is the evacuation uh, of images from an evacuation of the neonatal ICU, which was on the ninth floor um, that made global headlines. And uh, on the right, just an example, you know, from the wildfires in California, the famous campfire. Um, these are images of the evacuation of the Feather River, River Hospital, which is a small community hospital. I believe it's around 150 beds. That, that facility caught fire just after they were done evacuating. It was pretty quick and that hospital became contaminated. Lots more examples, both in this country and elsewhere. So we are, we are deeply impacted. Um, Hurricane Maria, uh, a lot of our medical supplies were manufactured on the island of, Mar of, um, of Puerto Rico, uh, resulting in, in mass shortages, most notably that made headlines or saline shortages. Um, in my own specialty of anesthesia, we were running short on these, um, the small vials of bupivacaine that have um, dextrose additives to make, uh, increase the, the, make them hyperbaric. Um, these uh, two ML vials um, completely ran out nationally. These are in our epidural and spinal kits. And so we're having to swap out these 30 ML vials of bupivacaine and to prevent cross-contamination, we're having to throw out the rest. So we only use one and a half, 1.2 to 1.5 MLs. And so we had this, this perverse situation where we were a national shortage and we were having to waste this drug. So this is directly impacting the care that we provide. Um, and there's a lot of similarities with the COVID pandemic. So supply chain vulnerabilities. So we had 
um, complete shutdown of manufacturing plants, interruptions of transportation, and whether it's COVID or climate change, the, there's a lot of similarities. For you know, If there's a weather-related disruption, you're going to see similar problems of disruption in our supply chain, um, not just PPE, which you're seeing images of. Um, obviously, you know about ventilators, we're short video laryngoscope, uh, blades, um, drugs for sedation, all our patients on ventilators, dialysis supplies, and so forth. So this is a global concern for us as healthcare providers. So now let's uh, flip the conversation to ask, what does healthcare have to do with climate change? Well, we know that we are um, running our facilities 24-7. It's high with high-tech diagnostic and therapeutic equipment. Hospitals have very high energy intensity, two and a half times out of equal size commercial buildings. We have unique requirements for infection prevention, um, different, different from any other industry. Um, the food industry might be somewhat similar, but we are rather unique. Uh, we have a lot of regulatory complexity and business models that are driving wasteful, unnecessary utilization resources. And quite frankly, we have a culture of excess and where disposability is normalized. And so this is uh, from our work with the Lancet Countdown uh, on Climate Change and Health. Uh, uh, as we know, healthcare in the United States is nearly 18% of our uh, gross domestic product. That's nearly twice that of high income nations and healthcare is 10% of the global economy. So it stands to reason that healthcare is um, responsible for a significant fraction of our pollution. Globally, healthcare emits 4.6% of our total global greenhouse gases. And in fact, we, we just updated this to the most recent year. Um, we're now at 4.9%, so that's rising. Uh, and uh, a quarter of this is coming from the US. The US is an outlier here. And so we're responsible for 25% of global healthcare greenhouse emissions, and we're only 4% of the global population. So we're really out of balance in our country. Uh, and so US healthcare has the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, now, as I mentioned earlier, of course we can reduce our emissions by providing less care. That's not what we're suggesting. Um, in fact, a quarter of healthcare services are deemed inappropriate or low value. And uh, um, as we see in this graph here, which is looking at greenhouse gas emissions, this is correlated with the Healthcare Access and Quality Index, which is a comp composite measure from the Institute of Healthcare Metrics, essentially looking at things like access to primary care, um, clinical outcomes. Um, uh, and, and as we can see, firstly, and longevity is another one, but as we can see, Firstly, US is, the U.S. is not the highest performer. These are, are all OECD nations. US, the U.S. is not the highest performer. Um, and uh, so looking at France, for example, about 400, 450 kilograms of CO2 emissions per patient. So all these are performing better. And the, uh, um, what this means is that we have the opportunity to reduce our emissions without impacting, impacting healthcare quality. Yeah, so the U.S. is about 1,800 kilograms for CO2 per capita. So we're about four times other nations here. And at the same time, half the world lacks access to essential services. 100 million pushed to extreme poverty because of health services. Now, of course, I was, as I'm sure all of you were very concerned with the COVID pandemic, that we we're going to run out of resources, that patients were going to die because we ran out of resources, as was happening in New York, as was happening in, in other parts of the world. Um, and, and, you know, big shout out to Dr. Kenny for, for all the work that he did to help secure our supply chain so that we didn't face that moral dilemma of having to having to ration resources but now we're no longer feeling those shortages in our own institution and you know people are back to the same old wasteful practices and it's pretty heartbreaking because there are still global shortages just because we don't feel shortages at our institution doesn't mean that there aren't global shortages so we still have to whether we feel those shortages or not we have to do a better job of conserving resources as part of our moral duty so our work um, on the u.s healthcare sector uh, uh, the u.s healthcare sector is eight and a half percent of our total nation's greenhouse gas emissions this is our latest 10-year trend between 10, 2010 and 2018 you see a slight dip until around 2012 having to do with um, uh, switches to more renewable resources as a nation, but healthcare continues to rise 
um, over 6% annually. And uh, US, so US healthcare damages from pollution around 388,000 disability adjusted life years lost annually. And that's especially due to air pollution, but also from climate change related impacts. And so this is in fact, similar in magnitude to med medical errors as first reported in the Eris Human Report. Why this is important is that that report sparked the entire patient safety movement, that everything we do is for the sake um, or excuse me, is through the lens of, of patient safety to try and prevent medical errors. Our actuaries from that report say that about 10 years of life are lost per death. So if you multiply by 10, you see we're in the same order of magnitude of damages from healthcare pollution as from preventable medical errors. And so really what we're trying to say is, is that pollution prevention is a new patient safety movement. So where are all those emissions within healthcare? And so we use the greenhouse gas scoping protocol, which is a way of classifying those emissions. And uh, so scope one are direct releases from a, a hospital or a facility, for example, from on-site boilers or from inhaled anesthetics, which are blown off our rooftop. Scope two refers to our purchase electricity um, and scope three is our supply chain. So everything upstream and downstream that supports all the services and care that we give and energy here is embodied energy. And so about four fifths of that footprint is coming from the supply chain, notably pharmaceuticals and chemicals, medical devices and supplies and food. And so healthcare administrators, clinicians and regulators, we're the ones who control consumption and the demand and what's appropriate and inappropriate. Manufacturers and regulators control what's embedded in those um, products and what goes to marketplace. So this helps us to understand where the hot spots are and where the levers are to try and improve um, the situation. And at the same time, we know from uh, Don Berwick's work, former head of CMS and now the, and the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, that about one third of US healthcare is wasteful. This is for a number of reasons, um, including failures of care delivery, care coordination, overtreatment, administrative complexity, and so on. So there's no easy solution to all this, but th there are lots of opportunities here to reduce waste without compromising the care that we provide to patients. And so in terms of solid waste, this is a very old figure. There's actually not great data. This is uh, well over 10 years now, but US hospitals uh, produce about 5.9 million, uh, million tons of um, solid waste annually. Most of that is incinerated, which causes its own issues. Uh, some of the trash requires special handling, such as our biohazardous waste, again, unique to our industry. There are only 10 facilities in the U.S. that handle that biohazardous waste. So for when I first started giving these talks, we were shipping our waste to Texas. Um, now it, um, uh, I, it's somewhere out in the um, uh, mid uh, um, uh, Midwest that uh, it's going to, but over a thousand miles, we ship our biohazardous waste. So it does matter whether you, you toss the, you, things unnecessarily into that, that red bin. We need to, need to do a better job of uh, segregating our waste. About one third of hospital trash comes from the operating rooms. And there's con this concerning trend towards single use disposable medical devices. And there's um, uh, perceived issues of improved safety, lower cost, and bottom line is that disposables are more convenient, whether it's your to-go coffee mug in the morning um, or our, um, our plates coming from uh, the cafeteria, it's just more convenient and we really need to reevaluate that. And so obviously we need to prevent infections that's foundational to what we do. Um, healthcare acquired infections are the most frequent adverse event um, in healthcare delivery globally, hundreds of millions of patients each year, um, affecting morbidity, morbidity, mortality, increasing costs. Um, of every 100 hospitalized patients, seven in the developed and 10 in developing countries will suffer at least one healthcare infection. So obviously we don't want to compromise patient safety. We do need to prevent infection. Uh, uh, and if we fail to do so, we are increasing pollution by increasing the, the care that is required. But this infection prevention um, uh, goal of zero, um, zero infections, while it's a laudable goal, we have to question whether or not it's realistic. It's driving this trend towards single-use disposable devices and also drug waste from the examples I just gave you. 
And so uh, this is a look at the history of surgical site infection progress um, and uh, survivability from surgery. So back in the 1800s, for example, if you had a major surgery such as a leg amputation, you had about a 95% chance of getting infected. I, I would actually think that would be closer to 100, but we'll accept 95. And you had about a 40% chance of survival. Then along came Semmelweis, Pasteur, Lister, germ theory, antisepsis, asepsis, and you see this massive um, uh, curve uh, decrement in, in the infection rate and massive increase in survivability. The next little dip you see here um, uh, uh, was around World War II and the introduction of antibiosis. And you see a, 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 a rapid decline as we improved our prophylaxis protocols and now under 5% chance of getting infected and greater than 95% survival. If we take that curve and blow it out more, you see we're throwing more and more resources trying to get to zero infections, and we're ignoring the fact that the increased consumption, whether it's reusables or disposables, is causing indirect disease burden that we haven't been looking at, and we need to really take that into consideration. So it really sort of begs the question, is the goal of zero healthcare acquired infections realistic? And so as we know, causes of infection are multifactorial. And things that are important include staff discipline, antiseptic, aseptic techniques, hand washing. We know we don't do enough hand washing, even though uh, we know better. Uh, patient health status, patients who are immunocompromised, who have diabetes, um, where the exposure site is, a quantity and type of that inoculation, and so forth. So all these things contribute to infections. Um, we're not going to cure diabetes by throwing more disposables at the problem. We're not going to cure the problem with hand washing. So we really need to go at the root cause. So what is life cycle assessment? This is a modeling tool that we use to quantify emissions um, uh, across the entire lifespan of the, of the things that we use. We tend to think about stuff when we use it. Um, we think a a much less about what goes into manufacturing and even far less in terms of material, raw material extraction. And maybe um, something that's more visible and people get concerned about is what happens when we throw these things away. There are emissions that happen at every point here. And in order to understand what's environmentally preferable, we need to consider the entire life cycle. And so it's not intuitive where those emissions are. Again, what's disposed of is, is most visible, but that may not be the problem. And so, again, I said that we're talking mostly about carbon emissions, uh, but there are other pollutants, and we have to ensure that we're not simply shifting one problem to another. Um, and this, is, this information is used to de, um, improve design and decision support, so LCAs. And so I'm going to give you an example from uh, anesthesia. And why this example came up is that we suddenly started shifting across the country to single-use disposable laryngoscopes, which uh, from our, our stainless steel reusables. And, and, and the reason why is that the handle and the tongue blade are considered separate units. The tongue blade goes down to central sterilization supply for high level, minimum high-level disinfection. Um, the handle historically has been low-level disinfected um, in the operating room. And there's a, a loophole in the regulations about what level classification this handle should be. Industry has been all over that. Now the, the Joint Commission is all over that. And so your options are the handle is now considered um, uh, uh, some, many are, it's confusing. Some can still consider it low level. Others say this is um, uh, intermediate risk and therefore you can't do um, point of care cleaning. Your options are to start hand, sending the handle down to central sterilization of supply or just go with a disposable option. And so across the country, there's been this massive wave of going to single use disposables. And so we very carefully reviewed the literature and there's actually no evidence to suggest that, that from an a infection control standpoint that this is necessary. But just to briefly review for um, uh, our students and, and residents in the audience, we have three different classifications for our devices for infection risk. Critical items, those that normally contact sterile tissues must be sterilized. Semi-critical devices, those that contact mucous membranes like the tongue blade of a laryngoscope um, and a lot of the, the um, supplies that you possibly use are semi-critical. So they, they don't need to be sterile. Those areas of the body are not sterile. So they require a minimum high-level disinfection. 
non-critical items, things that touch the skin, like blood pressure cups, and you would think a, a handle of, of a laryngoscope blade, those require lower intermediate disinfection, and that can be done at point of use with a chemical white cloth. So we did a study comparing reusable and disposables. This is what the, the scoping diagram looks like. So from the single-use disposable raw materials all the way down to solid waste management. For the reusables, it's a little more complex, right? Because we do reuse them, they do require some repairs. Um, we looked at different options, low-level disinfection of the handle, um, high-level disinfection of the handle. Um, sterilization, including refurbishment. So we looked at all the different cleaning options and then eventually waste management. We also paired this with a, a life cycle costing um, that included not only um, procurement and refurbishing costs, but also labor required um, to handle uh, the cleaning and eventual disposal. And so there's a lot of information on this. If you just kind of squint at it, I'm just gonna briefly point out on the left are the tongue blades, on the right are the handles. P is for plastic disposable, single-use disposable. S is for stainless steel disposable, and then the different cleaning options. So the tongue blades can't be low-level disinfected, so that's why you see three options on the right. And so just squinting at this, the first thing that you notice is that disposables have um, several fold more impacts, um, CO2 emissions impacts over their life cycle than the reusables. The second thing I wanna point out is waste disposable. So the red is, is the waste disposal phase. Now we'll tell you these companies say, oh, we're a green product, you can just recycle. Firstly, you have to have a vendor that is willing and able to re recycle. These are complex supplies. They're, they're no vendor locally is gonna take this. You need a specialized vendor. Um, the company will provide you one within a thousand miles. Um, so, but we, it, you can't recycle all these components. It's not possible, but just as a what if, we said, what if you could recycle all the components? And this uh, bar here represents that alternative scenario of 100% recycling. And the point is here is that we can't recycle our way out of this issue. And uh, as I said, there's the, the infection control argument. We, we, that's a whole nother um, several slides but uh, there is no justification for this. Now, what did this do for costs? At Yale New Haven Hospital, just here on York Street campus, my department does around 60,000 intubations a year. So we looked at the per use costs um, and the single use disposable was uh, several times more expensive than the reusables. Um, by about $700,000 combined. And so, um, uh, and then one of the questions we say, well, it costs so much to, to clean them and therefore it's cheaper to go with the disposables. Well, firstly, we, we reprocess about 12,000 instruments a day. This would increase what we reprocess by on average 167 um, instruments a day because um, we're already reprocessing the tongue blades. So between one and 2% it would increase. So firstly, we would not have to increase labor um, in our central sterilization supply department. But even if we did, the institution would still um, benefit from a cost perspective. So another criticism is, well, these things get lost and, and they're very expensive and therefore it's still more, I would say that uh, what I just showed to you assumes that we have, um, as a manufacturer guarantees, 4,000 uh, uses of those stainless steel devices. And in fact, when you refurbish the, the the components, they're virtually indestructible. But assuming, we assume 4,000 uses, one of the, um, so that means that one one thousandth of the manufacturing and the disposable, uh, sorry, one four thousandth of the manufacturing disposable plus the cleaning and packaging is compared to one disposable. So if we were to, to lose them, um, what we did a break even analysis and found that you would have to, that, at about four to five uses of the handle and five to seven of the blade, that's your break even on costs. And we also did cleaning time. So we, we um, our cleaning time was corroborated with a study from um, Australia. Um, you know, if your cleaning time took, you know, instead of uh, two minutes overall, 23 to 26 minutes and so forth um, uh, for the handle and 10 to 13 minutes for the blade. So in other words, um, if, if you take that long to clean, you have to retrain your staff. If you're losing your devices after only a few uses, you have to retrain your staff. The answer isn't, you just go to disposable devices. 
So a note on energy. So this is assuming U.S. energy mix, so which is a fraction of renewables, a fraction of nuclear, um, coal, and so forth. So we use the average energy mix. If you did the same study in Europe, the, um, the reusables will look that much more favorable because they have higher renewable resources. If you did the same study in Australia, the disposables will look favorable because their reprocessing, their energy for reprocessing is heavily dependent on brown coal. Um, the answer isn't in Australia to go to disposables. The answer is we need to clean up our energy system. And so this is uh, one study I found from the um, uh, urology literature looking at a reusable versus a disposable uridoscope. And this particular study found that um, uh, about the same carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, whether it's reusable or disposable. And I remember when this came out, um, uh, a lot of uh, having some conversations with a lot of your staff. Now, a few things. Now, this study, the, the methods were not <clears throat> reproducible. I, you know, I just want to point that out. But <clears throat> assuming it, it was a, a solid study, I will say the neglected transportation. So for every one reusable you're transporting, that's 100. Um, so for every one reusable you're transporting, that's 180 disposables because that's how many uses they got. got. But the important thing here I want to point out also is that this study was done in Australia. So it's about the same. So again, um, if you did this study in the US or, or Europe, uh, the reusables would look far more favorable. And so we really have to look carefully into the details of these studies and think of, think of them critically. It really just begs the question, what does a disposable mean? A uh, single-use disposable label, that's an industry desig designation. It's not a, a regulatory de designation. It doesn't mean the device can't be reused. What it does mean is that whomever cleans the device assumes the risk and re responsibility of its function as if they were the original manufacturer. Hospitals don't want that responsibility, so there's a whole third-party market called reprocessing. What that just means is an outsourcing of the cleaning um, and so, um, uh, and then there was questions about whether or not that was safe. Um, it's a highly regulated market. Uh, each device that gets reprocessed, um, the, each company will do their own assessment of how many times that can be done safely. They have to apply for FDA approval. There was a Government Accountability Commission um, uh, report by Congress back, back in 28 that essentially found that there was no increased risk of reusables um, reusing these SUDs as as um, compared to a new device. But unfortunately, only two to 3% of all SDUs, uh, SUDs are um, reprocessed in the United States. I'm gonna jump back to COVID for a moment here. Now, um, out of um, desperation, we were reprocessing uh, uh, these masks. And again, a big shout out for Dr. Kenny for, for helping make that possible. Um, also, we have, um, we were out of desperation reprocessing gowns or, uh, and um, also our um, single use disposable video learning scope handles because third party vendors hadn't already gone through an FDA approval process. We had to figure out how to do it on the fly. Um, whether it's a third party vendor or us, we figured out how to do this safely. Now, these are not built, these masks are not built for durability, but they could be. But um, so the, it really just kind of begs the question, if we have reusable options, if we can reprocess things, what's the difference between a single use and a disposable device anyway? Now, obviously things that are difficult to clean, um, small tubing, intravenous tubing and so forth, we shouldn't be reusing those things, of course. Um, but uh, we can do a better job in shifting more to what's called a circular economy. Um, right now we have a linear economy, a take make waste where we extract materials, we design things, we use them and then we throw them away. Circular economy um, means we try and keep the materials in use as they're at their highest level possible. Um, and uh, uh, we have to design them to, to make them easier to clean and reuse. Um, we obviously have to reduce our use of materials. Um, the last thing we want to do is recycle. As I showed to you, the benefits are minimal. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't do it, but we can't recycle our way out of this problem. That's the last thing we should be doing. We really need to move upstream and design for reuse and reduce our, our consumption and use to begin with. Um, I'm going to switch um, pretty briefly to inhaled anesthetics. Um, this is, in fact, part of where my research journey began. Um, it turns out that, you know, we've got a scavenging system on our anesthesia machines. 
nobody ever taught me what that meant in my imagination. I thought it meant it somehow um, rendered these gases innocuous and I, and some, and I had no idea what happened to them. The scavenging system is simply a medical gas evacuation system. So to protect the indoor environmental exposure, occupational exposure, the scavenging system is just sucking the gas and blowing off the rooftop. Um, inhaled anesthetics are destructive to the ozone layers are very potent greenhouse gases and their emissions are not controlled. So we did uh, one of our first studies um, comparing different inhaled anesthetics and the intravenous general anesthetic alternative propofol. And again, just squint at this, some take home messages include that um, you can't even see propofol here because the inhaled anesthetics are, have four orders of magnitude greater greenhouse gas emissions on a life cycle basis. So that's one take home message. The other, the blue here is the non-waste um, phases. In the case of inhaled anesthetics, the vast majority of the emissions are coming from what we're blowing off our rooftops. And so that, that is an opportunity for trying to do some impact assessment. And the other here is some outliers are deaths rain as a gas is 20 times the impacts of um, equivalent doses, uh, clinically equivalent doses of isoflurin and sevoflurane. And it also turned out to be the most expensive. We got rid of this drug um, based on this study back in 2013, saved our health system $1.2 million. Nitrous oxide is also another um, offending drug. And so um, this tells us what drugs we can use, um, try to avoid where the mitigation opportunities are. What about non-inhaled anesthetics? So looking at regional anesthesia, this is a, a upper extremity nerve block. Um, neuraxial, spinal epidural, or total intravenous anesthesia. So I mentioned propofol, and by the way, that did include the energy in the pump and the plastics to deliver, which is a common question I get. But what about all the other drugs and supplies that we use? We hypothesize that anything that used inhaled anesthetic would have a much higher footprint. So again, just kind of squinting at that, each of these represents a different um, clinical care pathway or a different approach to anesthetic care. So if we have choices, we should choose one that is least harmful to the environment. And we, we um, found our hypothesis was correct. Anything, any anesthetic approach that included inhaled anesthetics um, was uh, far worse from a greenhouse gas perspective. Now, it's not always possible to do these other approaches. The, the point is when we have choices. So what about different approaches to surgery? This is a study from um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Cassandra Thiel. This is, she's an environmental engineer. This is actually her PhD thesis. She looked at different approaches to hysterectomy. Um, so this is everything that's used on the surgical side, the reusables, the disposable instruments, the drapes, um, pathology um, uh, uh, specimens, um, energy to run the HVAC systems and lighting and capital equipment and on the anesthesia side, inhaled anesthetics. And so the first thing to take away here is that the minimally invasive approaches have a much higher impact than the open approaches. Um, and that one third to two thirds of the impacts is coming from inhaled anesthetics, which is shocking. And the other vast majority is coming from the single use disposable devices. Now, obviously you're not gonna use this to decide whether or not you're gonna do minimally invasive surgery um, that really is, is dictated by the patient requirements. But here's a question. Um, is there an advantage to robotic surgery over laparoscopic in terms of patient outcomes? Um, you know, we, can cer we certainly believe that there is, but what does the evidence demonstrate? And what does that do the cost? And by the way, this does not include the, the um, well, it does include the energy for the capital equipment. It does not include the emissions from the construction of the, the, the life cycle of the actual device, the robot itself. And so this is a study we're doing now. Um, Dr. Leapman is leading, um, looking at the environmental impact of transrectal ultrasound guided prostate biopsy. This is what the scoping diagram looks like. Um, so all the, the upstream um, manufacturing of all the materials, um, uh, pre-biopsy MRI, the clinic visit, the pathology analysis, and then what happens downstream and, and including um, uh, different levels of cleaning. So a lot, a lot went into this study and these are what the results look like. Um, breaking it down by step, the MRI step, the actual ultrasound guided biopsy in the clinic, and then the pathology footprint. And some takeaways here in, include that the MRI step is over half of the footprint. 
um, and that uh, energy, um, including um, both on and off hours, um, that's the, the blue and the orange here, is a big contribution. Staff travel is another contribution. And then the supply um, production, the energy to produce those materials um, is another big portion here. And so it really, uh, I have to ask the question, uh, uh, do, uh, what is the benefit of, of doing the MRI? Now, Dr. Leitman tells me that you pick up 30% uh, more um, cancers um, with, by adding the MRI screening. And so the question I throw out um, uh, is, uh, what does that translate in terms of lives saved and um, also uh, in terms of false positives, what does that um, mean in terms of harm and cost? So I don't know the answers to the, these questions, or I pose them um, to you. And so getting to the end here, so just want to point out why all this um, uh, global um, uh, attention, um, particularly now in the news to climate change and with President Biden saying we want to get to 50% reduction by 2050, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which is the, the global scientific um, uh, body with over 6,000 scientists, um, basically say that, um, so as I mentioned, we were already at one degree warming centigrade. The trajectory, if we don't make any changes by the end of the century, we're going to increase average surface temperature between four and five degrees centigrade, which is not hospitable for civilization. And so current policies are gonna curb us to only three to 3.7 degrees centigrade. Um, Current pledges to, um, with the Paris Agreement, which the Paris Agreement says let's let's limit to two degrees, um, but let's aim for one and a half degrees. But our current pledges don't even get us to where we want to go, and really, to uh, we can't stop climate change, but what we want to do is slow it down um, to the point where we're averting the worst possible harms to uh, global health and allowing civilization time to adapt. And so really all the aim and focus is trying to limit us to one and a half degrees centigrade. And to, to do that, we need to curb our emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. This is possible in the laws and physics, um, and this has caused the IPCC chair to say the next few years are the most important in all of human history. And so just some good news, the National Health Service, which is the largest uh, health system, uh, national health system globally, um, the third largest employer globally after the US military and the Chinese military. They have a greener NHS initiative. They've committed to get to net zero by 2040 and part of the group that has done these analytics. Again, where are the missions coming in their system? And what are the possible interventions and at what point can we get to, to net zero? And we've calculated it can be done by 2040 with various interventions. And uh, so we need a similar global effort and we need a similar effort here in the United States. And so um, some take home messages um, include, uh, we, we need more appropriate care. So what does that mean? We need to provide care that is needed, wanted, clinically effective, affordable, equitable, and responsible in its use of resources. And when we think about what value means, not only is it um, the, the triple bottom line, which is the most care for the, um, the best care for the most patients at the least cost, we also have to minimize our social and financial impacts as well. And that's, um, sorry, social and environmental impacts as well. And uh, with that, I thank you, and I'll take some questions. I was asking if there have been any, um, any efforts to think of our resource expenditure as a, uh, as a, a quality or, or, or value measure that we can track over time. Um, and has that been done successfully in other models? Um, so I'd say uh, we are definitely interested in doing that and Dr. Kenny might have um, more insight than I do. I will say we're actively trying to do this here. That is the argument. Um, we think that there should be pay for performance around resource consumption. And we also say, you know, that there um, certainly is um, some value-based payment models around cost containment. And we're trying to say that that should also be used um, to pair environmental emissions um, as well. So I don't know if Dr. Kenny has any further insight. I don't. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. 
this is Mary Ann Pasarelli. So I think there's several things in our own department that are very wasteful that we could do to try to try to cut back on medical waste. I mean, I think um, one of the things is that we look at is like the disposables we use when we um, do cystoscopies. Like if you talk about what we do with YPB versus the other outpatient sites, the whole draping thing, which is not done in the outside offices that's done in YPB. I mean, it's really not necessary. And that amount of paper waste that comes from that. I mean, I think there's, if you just look on a daily basis of what we do, I think there's a lot of ways we can save waste. Um, and I guess that we need to sort of readdress some of those things that we do. So the other thing I think that's important is the use of the telehealth and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions by just saving patients from coming into the office and transportation that we have to remember that that's also going to be helpful moving forward. Right. Well, I, I love those suggestions and I would say it would be um, uh, helpful to have, um, you know, if, if you're willing to have some sort of concerted effort around it. My own um, specialty actually has um, uh, our um, ACGME requirements have a QI um, requirement and also our board recertification has a QI requirement. So a lot of our students, I'm sorry, our residents are um, being turned to these resource conservation opportunities. So that's one, one way or, or even having some person who, you know, would be willing to coordinate. And in terms of telehealth, that is a really important means um, to not only improve access to care for those who um, are um, immobile, um, have uh, um, have you know other limitations. Um, so, um, and at the same time, we have to make sure that people have, you know, uh, the ability to get the technology and the Wi-Fi that they need. Um, the the we also have to understand that that is actually increasing emissions in some regard, right? Because we are increasing electronic requirements, we are increasing energy demands. Um, so we have to be sure to use the, le the least tech that is necessary. If a phone call will do, do you know, there may be advantages to a video ca call um, in terms of rapport and so forth, but you know, just, just keep in mind that there are energy draws. Um, but one of the biggest benefits of, of telehealth that I see is decommissioning um, clinic buildings. My understanding is that with the COVID pandemic, two of our three clinic buildings were, were um, shut down and that everybody loved it so much that um, we're trying to um, uh, make that endure. So that is a huge opportunity as well. Hey, Dr. Sherman, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, one question that, you know, whenever I, I hear a talk like this that I think comes up that is really helpful for people to take away from is, do you have maybe one or two low effort, high impact things that every one of us could be doing every day? Um, because I, what I find often is I'll hear a talk like this, I'll get all fired up and, you know, a few weeks later, I'm back to my usual. So are, are there any uh, kind of, again, low, low effort, high impact things that we could kind of change with our day to day? Right. You know, uh, it, it's a bit easier for me in my own specialty <laughs> to make such, such suggestions. Um, but I would say that, um, and, and so I'm really sort of reliant on you, but, you know, we just got an ex excellent suggestion about, you know, can we reformulate some of how some of our kits or our procedures? Do we need to drape? Do we need, you know, do we need things to be sterile for non-sterile procedures is a question I asked and a lot of, um, a lot of different types of surgical care that I see going on where, you know, we'll open up sterile drapes and sterile gowns and gloves, and then uh, we'll, we'll sit down in a chair and, and touch things are not sterile because we don't really need things to be sterile. So, but, you know, bottom line is, do we need to prescribe things? Do we need to open things? Um, do we need to perform things in the operating room that can be done in a clinic? Uh, can we perform, can we prescribe, um, lifestyle improvements or can we refer, refer people to primary care specialists who can do more about lifestyle. Now, obviously, these are, are very difficult. Um, you know, it's difficult to address lifestyle issues, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. But the vast majority, 80% of health is dependent on, on conditions outside of the care that we provide. So we really need to start looking more closely at that. And I'm sorry if that's not a satisfying answer. It's a great question. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I really leave it to you to, to come up with some suggestions and I would love to hear them. Great, thank you.
Well, if you have any more um, ideas or questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, I welcome uh, uh, hearing anything, uh, any ideas you have. And uh, I thank you again for this um, opportunity and I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thanks have a so good much. Weekend. Wonderful talk.